Good morning. Uh, uh, today we have a dis distinguished panel of guests uh, with us. We have Dr. Ramesh Bhatt, Professor Chipitowski, and Professor Bura Dori with us. And we'll be talking about rosacea and a little bit about hydradenitis suppurativa as well. And I think we'll be able to get some good points out of these experts that we have on the panel today. So uh, I would like to start by asking uh, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, sir, would you just give a broad overview of how you approach a patient of rosacea? So uh, a patient of milder rosacea, probably mainly from the point of view of topical therapy and uh, a slightly more severe uh, version, uh, what would you, or your choice be for systemic therapy as well? Uh, rosacea is a chronic inflammatory condition, um, mainly affecting the face. It can also involve the uh, surface of the nose as well as uh, eyes and uh, more common in women, but uh, we see good number of cases in men also. Many a times there may be associated uh, gastrointestinal uh, problems also. Alcohol will um, exacerbate uh, rosacea and uh, some of the common symptoms that we see is flushing, papules and pustules and uh, erythema and chronic cases there will be thickening of the skin and especially on the nose it may result in uh, rhinophyma and uh, it is a chronic condition many a times uh, reducing the quality of life of the patients and uh, the milder ones can be treated with the topical medications. Uh, the one which are commonly used are topical antibiotics like clindamycin, metronidazole and uh, because there is some uh, role for uh, demodex folliculorum also, ivermectin is also used topically and uh, drugs like uh, bromonidine and uh, oxymetazolin are also topically used and uh, coming to the systemic therapy for rosacea uh, many uh, courses of antibiotics can be used in the management of rosacea like uh, doxycycline, azithromycin and uh, also minocycline. Uh, we may have to give for a longer duration of time. The other drug which sometimes helps especially when there is uh, uh, lots of erythema and papules and pustules is uh, isotretinoin. But in patients, if there is involvement of the eyes and dryness of the eyes, it is better to avoid isotretinoin. And uh, the other drug which helps especially as far as dryness of the eyes is concerned is uh, omega-3 fatty acids. This uh, in overall uh, the management of rosacea. Uh, of course, um, it requires prolonged treatment as it is a chronic condition and many a times we can just reduce the symptoms of the patients. Okay, so that's a good uh, overview that we've got of what the disease is about, how it presents, and how it's pr basically treated. Uh, Professor Boradori, I would like to ask you about the, uh, the recent uh, understanding of the pathogenesis of rosacea. We've implicated the uh, innate immune system, etc. Are we going to get some therapies out of that? Any idea? Uh, I I'm sorry, but uh, this is not my area of expertise. Okay, so I want to know. <laughs> so my next question was... <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, so anyway, so first let me finish Rosacea yeah. then. Yes. What yeah. basically yes. do you think, uh, uh, is there a role for, uh, uh, what kind of role do you see with Brimonidine, which has been uh, Yeah, Brimonidine, I think uh, the latest, um, we have used in a few patients, but the efficacy is temporary. And uh, we will have to use it frequently and uh, there will be some uh, benefit in, in these patients. Of course, uh, presently ivermectin topically is also being tried in uh, rosacea okay. and uh, uh, some of the studies have shown that it is a little better than metronidazole when compared to okay. metronidazole therapy for rosacea. Yeah. All right. So, uh, hmm. the next I think we'll move on to hydradenitis suppurativa then and Professor Shapitowski. Uh, most of our patients of HS present with uh, quite mild to moderate disease uh, in the beginning with just a few pustules, papules and cysts, etc. So what is your first line treatment uh, for mild HS in such patients and yeah, how do you advise them in addition this, to... This is a very good question and uh, that's a question also on the diagnosis of the disease. Yes. I had the feeling that we diagnose the hydradenitis suppurativa quite late and uh, especially in Europe Probably that's the same situation Absolutely. in your country, in India. The patient can go to the general practitioner, can go to the surgeon, can go to an other doctor. That's a problem because the dermatologist, they have the knowledge how to diagnose hydradenitis suppurativa. That can cause uh, quite frequently the delay 
in the early diagnosis. We did a study on it that was an international study and we showed that about seven years there is a delay in the establishment of the proper diagnosis. That's why the cases we see are not usually the mild okay. cases but a little bit more advanced, let's say moderate to severe hydradenitis suppurativa. But I completely understand your question, which is very important, that there are plenty of mild cases. So that's the most important, to make an early diagnosis and also uh, to, uh, to do the intervention as early as possible. For the mild cases, I do think that we can use a topical treatment. And a topical treatment, that's a treatment with a topical antibiotic, that's a clindamycin, and I prefer resorcinol. That's a high concentration of resorcinol. Okay. That's a 15% um, of resorcinol. That's based on one paper by the uh, group uh, from Denmark, but really it works in my hands, and probably it works better than topical uh, clindamycin. Yeah. Of course, one may consider also the oral antibiotics, but that's for the a little bit more severe cases. Okay. Uh, what about the lifestyle factors? Uh, because it is often said that uh, hydradenitis suppurativa is, is much more common in obese and overweight individuals. But we do see uh, lean patients with HS as well, and I think they tend to get missed out more. So what is your general uh, advice to patients who are lean as well as those who are overweight and obese? That's correct. Uh, definitely there is a genetic predisposition, but the environmental factors could play a role as well. The obese patients are very common, and in our cohort of patients, the majority of them are overweighted or even obese. So the reduction of the weight is very helpful. It's a helpful for the symptoms uh, uh, improvement, but that's a helpful also for our treatment. So we usually recommend the diet, we recommend uh, the control of the weight. It's easy to recommend, but it's not so easy to be done in the real life. So there is also the role of the bariatric surgery for those patients. And there are studies uh, documented in the literature that the bariatric surgery with a reduction, with a significant reduction of the weight was very beneficial for the hydradenitis suppurativa lesions. But that's not only the obesity, that's also the smoking habit. And that's important. There is a direct correlation between the smoking and the severity of hydradenitis suppurativa. So the lifestyle modifications are very, very important. Uh, wearing a loose clothing. Uh, there is uh, still just uh, the discussion ongoing if uh, it is of importance or it's not so important. But anyway, it's always better to advise the patients not to, to wear very tight clothes so that, that just a fraction can, can be limited. Uh, there is also the controversial issue on the hormonal status of the patients. Uh, it's not solved uh, in the literature, but anyway, the obesity and the smoking, it's clearly documented. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the newer treatments or the, or the kind of experimental treatments. We've had a premolast in India now for the past two years and there have been some studies that show a uh, good response to a premolast in hydradenitis suppurativa as well as a few case reports of naltrexone. So have you any experience at all with these two drugs? Because I ask because these are available. Uh, yeah. Easy. I understand the question. I do not have my personal experience okay. with uh, naloxone and apremilast, but definitely there is a role of anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, the hydradenitis suppurativa is a chronic inflammatory debilitating skin disease. And uh, of course, uh, in a, a little bit more advanced stages, it's necessary to control the inflammation. It's necessary to have a long-term control of inflammation. You can use uh, oral antibiotics. Now the first line is a combination of rifampicin with clindamycin. But uh, concerning the new developments, we are aware that there is a first biological agent improved. This is uh, adalimumab. It's very helpful, but there are ongoing clinical trials with other agents. I'm talking about the secukinumab, about other uh, anti-IL-17 agents, and also anti uh, C5. Uh, however, 
uh, some results are not so promising, some are very promising. Yes. I think that even the new anti-inflammatory agents will not solve completely the problem of hydradenitis superativa. You do know that there is a damage to the skin, there are scars, there are fistules, you cannot remove them with any conservative treatment. So there is still the role of the surgery in the management of hydradenitis suppurativa. So those anti-inflammatory agents can be helpful in early stages, uh, not so advanced ones, but also in advanced stages, they could help to really prepare the patient for the surgery and also they can allow the limitation, the, the, the extent of the surgery will be just uh, not so huge. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Borodori, so we shall uh, talk about pyodoma gangrenosum uh, with you. Uh, about what? Neutrophilic dermatosis. Yes, neutrophilic dermatosis, yes. This so was pyodoma gangrenosum is, yes. is a very common, uh, yes. probably the commonest neutrophilic dermatosis that we as dermatologists see. Yes. And uh, we often uh, face a problem where again, like HS, it has been treated like a bacterial infection with a lot of antibiotics uh, before the patient comes to us. So could you give some helpful pointers to uh, our young dermatologists as to how to diagnose pyodoma gangrenosum, especially the early stages which are not developed, that cribriform scarring or the textbook signs that we have, so the kind of pointers in history or examination? So this is a, a nice uh, but challenging question. It's the right question. So. Uh, Pyoderma gangrenosum is one of the prototypic examples of a neutrophilic disease. And uh, neutrophilic disease are nowadays considered uh, a paradigmatic example of auto-inflammatory conditions. Now, Pyoderma gangrenosum, now let's call it uh, like uh, my French colleagues and friends, Daniel Vallac, proposed uh, a, deep, a deep neutrophilic dermatosis where you have involvement in, uh, uh, of the dermis, hypodermis, leading to ulcerations and so plaques and ulceration. So the, the diagnosis is, uh, the principle is the diagnosis of exclusions. So, because uh, uh, in front of, uh, uh, new, uh, of the new development of ulcers uh, uh, in any patients, you have first to exclude all possible causes before making the diagnosis of neutrophilic uh, diseases. So it means you need a good clinical examination, you need good laboratory examination, you need skin biopsy uh, and, and a microbiological examination to exclude an underlying infectious cause, bacterial, fungi, uh, typical mycobacteria. And uh, then if everything is negative and if in addition you have a specific clinical context like an hematological disease, like a rheumatological disease, uh, like an autoimmune diseases, then you are more confident to make the diagnosis of pyoderma gangrenosum. Recently, a number uh, uh, there was uh, uh, published in JAMA Dermatology, if I'm not wrong, a, a, a proposal about diagnostic criteria of uh, uh, pyoderma gangrenoso. I would say that it's not always so easy. It's a diagnosis of exclusion, and uh, sometimes you you really have to wait the results of your exam investigation before starting an appropriate treatment. Uh, in your experience and at your centre, yes. what percentage of patients do you manage to find an underlying cause and what percentage roughly are idiopathic? So, uh, I would say I am working in a tertiary uh, referral centre. In many, uh, I would say in the majority, probably three quarters, there is an associated disease. Uh, which is usually an hematological disease or a rheumatological disease or a chronic gastrointestinal disease. Uh, probably 25-30% have no underlying disease. Exactly. So it's uh, a neutrophilic disease without obvious trigger or without obvious trigger. But uh, of course w when we do the diagnosis of uh, a neutrophilic disease in a patient, we just you usually suggest to closely follow the patient's for uh, paying attention to what's going on in the future. Later on. Okay. Uh, a question about non immunosuppressive treatments yes. of pyoderma gangrenosum. I'm specifically talking yes, about yes. things like minocycline, etc. Yes, what's your opinion of those treatments and how have they worked in your hands? So it depends always on the severity uh, or uh, limited disease, generalized disease, uh, limited severe disease with. A rapid enlarging ulceration or isolated lesions. Uh, if you have a patient with sweet syndrome with a couple of lesions, 
uh, you just treat potentially even with topical steroids uh, if uh, uh, the, uh, the patient suffers or so you can give for a short time of oral corticosteroids uh, in patients who have a limited disease with not a la high activity uh, even with certain form of puderma gangrenosa you may try with indeed toxic tetracycline doxycycline we don't use minocycline okay. at least in europe because of, well, we are afraid of the side effects stress and uh, uh, drug triggered uh, lupus uh, uh, you can also use uh, colchicine dapsone you are a little bit more uh, reluctant to use dapsone in elderly patients with heart disease because of the hemolysis but so there is place for non immunosuppressive therapy in certain patients with a moderate disease or limited disease and so and what is your uh, for severe patients what is your immunosuppressive therapy of choice so if you uh, if you when you have no problem yes all and you have availability free financial possibilities and so in the ideal case I think uh, anti TNF alpha blockers uh, like infliximab are rapidly active. If you don't have the chance to have uh, anti TNF alpha or new uh, anti so biological therapy like anti interleukin 17, uh, what we like is cyclosporine because it's rapidly acting. Uh, other person use uh, mycophenolate mofetil, but it's more slowly uh, working. Uh, Metotrexate, azathioprine, but they are more slowly acting. So among the immunosuppressive therapy commonly available, I think cyclosporine is probably the one with a broader spectrum and yeah. rapid uh, action of uh, effectiveness. Yes. I think, thank you very much, uh, Professor Thank you. Rory, thank Professor you. Chipitowski and Dr. Ramesh Bhatt. I think that will be the end thank of the session.